Welcome everyone to Photographers at Google. My name is Ricardo Lagos. I am a software developer, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our special guest, photographer Eric Chen. Eric's award-winning photography has been published over in over 60 magazines and books worldwide. He has won contests such as Nature's Best Magazine, photo, uh, Magazine's photo competition, which plays some of his work in the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. Eric is the editor and publisher of wetpixel.com, the premier online community for underwater photographers. Wetpixel provides a forum for photographers to share their work and to discuss ocean-related issues. In turn, educating viewers about the beauty and fragility of the marine ecosystem. Eric's work with wetpixel.com was awarded the prestigious Underwater Imaging Website of the Year from the Antibes Festival. Through WetPixel expeditions, Eric leads regular photography exp expeditions and workshops around the world. He has given seminars and lectures internationally at events such as TEDx, Boston Sea Rovers Clinic, DEMA, Digital Shootouts, Kona Classic, Scuba Diving Magazine events, and others. Eric is also involved in ocean conservation and is technical advisor and photographer for the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. He was head photographer for the Operation Musashi, Sea Shepherd's 2008 and 2009 anti-whaling campaign in Antar Antarctica, which was featured in season two of the hit TV show, Whale Wars. You can find more info about Eric and his photography at echang.com. Um, Eric, thanks for taking time to come to Google today and welcome. Thanks so much for having me. That was a very official bio. Uh, it's funny because Ricardo told me that in the, in the, bio, in the version that he sent out to Google, he, he said something like, Eric was bumming around for a few years and took some pictures. So both are accurate, and I you know, fully own up to both. Um, th thanks again for having me. Um, I actually started out as a software engineer. So uh, 12 years ago, or maybe I guess even longer now, uh, I, I worked in a cubicle. I guess cubes are not in anymore. Um, but uh, I, I started out in software and I sort of discovered photography. Um, I had discovered photography earlier than that, but had not uh, gone underwater with a camera. So nothing had ever stuck in the photography realm. And it was really when I, when I took a camera underwater that, um, that you know, it, it changed my life. And uh, it was the inspiration I needed to move my photography beyond something technical into something um, that really felt like photography. You know, before I could take a picture that was sharp, well exposed, but it never did anything for people, and uh, it was missing that the inspiration. Uh, so it very quickly changed my life, and I worked as a photographer uh, and publisher for about 10 years um, before coming back into industry, and now I'm at, uh, at Lytro, and there's a big Lytro contingent over here on the right side. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about just a little bit about the gear and technique involved in photography, but mostly tell stories, uh, underwater photography, but mostly tell stories about specific shots and locations. Um, this is a, a, a quick summary of kind of the, the housing market out there for, for cameras. Um, there's a huge range. So, you know, you can get kind of OEM plastic housings for point and shoot cameras for $150, $180. Um, but in the high end, typically a full rig for an SLR, aluminum housings, machined aluminum housings uh, with strobes and all the support necessary um, to hold those strobes, strobes with articulating arms, runs kind of $12,000 plus. So it's a huge range. Um, up there on the, in the middle is a, a GoPro housing. These are becoming more and more popular for underwater uh, video and photography, um, although until a few months ago, uh, they didn't focus underwater without third-party housings. Um, and I, had, I have met film crews out in the field who have discovered that after the shoot because they're, in fact, topside videographers taking cameras underwater thinking it's very much the same, but it is not. What's happening um, now as well is that these mirrorless cameras are becoming more and more popular underwater. Here's a, a little lineup of Nauticam housings. Uh, the Sony NEX series is, is pretty popular. Um, the NEX7 in particular is really interesting because you can put magnified optical viewfinders, uh, you know, to look at their very large electronic viewfinder underwater. And, um, and this Olympus, this OMDEM5, um, easy to remember model name, 
is, uh, is also really popular and people have been getting great results uh, with them. So things are, are changing underwater, typically a little bit behind what happens on land. This is a very old picture of me in the water. This is from 2003 with my second SLR rig. Uh, it was a Canon D60 CNC housing. But pretty much the, um, you know, the anatomy of an underwater rig has not changed. You, know, you have some kind of housing, a very large dome port for wide angle, um, for the optics, that, uh, you know, for, for clear, sharp, wide angle shots underwater, um, some kind of lighting. So in this case, two Icolite strobes and articulating arms. Uh, this is a shot that's a little bit more recent. Um, again, the, the cameras have not changed that much um, in the professional underwater photography world, still photography world. Um, this is a C-cam housing uh, with a Canon 1DS Mark III. So one thing that is um, very specific to underwater photography is that um, we basically carry around mobile studios. So you know we're carrying strobes, articulating arms, and underwater photography is almost completely manual. So we shoot manual exposure, manual strobes, um, and uh, the idea is basically to expose for the background and fill the foreground. Um, there's not very much color underwater, so water strips out light starting from red all the way down the spectrum, and so we need to bring uh, full spectrum lighting down to get these colors to pop. Uh, this is a picture um, taken with a setup like the one you saw on the previous slide. Uh, it's a very wide-angle shot uh, taken in eastern Indonesia in Raja Ampat. Those of you who are divers will recognize Raja Ampat as being, um, you know, sort of this, the place where the reefs are the best. Um, it's an incredible location. It's incredibly diverse. And um, in fact, if you go underwater and count fish for a fixed amount of time, which is how they measure diversity, uh, this area has the highest diversity of any area in the world uh, underwater. Um, and, you know, there are some theories about why this might be. Um, one theory is that during the Ice Age, everything froze over except for this section, and so the fish sort of survived here and then repopulated around the world. Because it's incredibly remote, most of the diving in places like this are done by liveaboard dive vessel. Um, the liveaboards are, are usually pretty nice. Uh, this is one that I went on on the upper left, um, and, uh, and the diving's done by, by tender. When I started going here, the, nobody was there. You know, there were two, maybe two boats out there. Uh, now it is incredibly popular and is managed as uh, a national park. But because it's very remote, you know, and there are dozens of liveaboards operating there, you still don't see very many people when you go. Uh, so in addition to uh, really nice reefs, there's a lot of marine life here. Um, this is a school of bait fish um, over a reef that looks what a reef looks like if you're kind of 20 feet away. So this is what everything looks like underwater until you light it. Um, and this was really cool. These, these bait fish were actually being hunted by jacks. And so you can see the whole school kind of moving um, as one organism. Um, so that action is pretty interesting, but it's hard to get an interesting picture from something like this. Um, so while it's interesting to look at, um, you have to think about how to get a shot. Um, in this, this little um, ledge there, or a, a bunch of interesting corals. These are unusual corals to see under the water. They're very, very shallow and particularly interesting because they're in a location where you can shoot upwards through the surface of the water and see some trees. Um, so I kind of played around here and took some shots, um, but did I felt like something was missing. And uh, so I went back to that location and, j and just kind of waited. And I noticed that the, um, those bait fish were moving around a lot on top of me. So I just waited and I took a lot of pictures. Uh, and eventually, I got the shot that I wanted, um, which was a shot where the bait fish were above me, but you could see through the school, um, you know, to see some of the sur those surface elements. So this how, is. How shallow is it? So how shallow is it, and is it natural light? It's very shallow. It's like ten feet deep. It is natural light in the background, but strobe filled in the, in the foreground. This is in the, the shadow of a, a, large, a cliff, uh, and so there's no light. If you had taken this without, you would have gotten just silhouette. So lighting is really interesting underwater because there are a lot of particles floating around. So if you use a flash that's very close to the lens, it lights up all of those particles between you and your subject. That's called backscatter. 
um, even though the visibility was not that great in the shot that I showed before, you don't see very much backscatter. And that's because we light things like this. So this, was, this is a picture of my friend uh, David Fleetham's setup. Um, and it illustrates how we position strobes. So where, those, where the fall off lighting intersects is where you want your subject to be. And the reason we do that is so that none of the water between you and the subject is illuminated. And uh, so it doesn't just you know, ruin your shot. Question. Our, our cameras neutrally buoyant. They can be made to be neutrally buoyant. How about your setup? Mine is slightly negative. Um, historically, manufacturers have not paid attention to buoyancy, and th they should. Video, manuf video housing manufacturers do pay quite a lot of attention to uh, to buoyancy. Um, but if it's too heavy, it becomes very difficult to, to hold. So we'll typically put um, closed cell foam floats on the setup to make it more buoyant until it's you know where you like it. If it's totally neutral, it al I find that it also becomes difficult to use for stills. So again, here's the shot from before, and you can see the strobes are really never pointing at the subject. They're always pointing slightly out, so the fall off light is what kind of brushes the subject in front of you. It's a nice soft light. Um, and of course, the choice of strobe matters. You know, some strobes have a very hard edge, and it's, it's hard to use that, um, that fall off lighting to light your subjects. So again, the goal is really to expose for the background and to fill the foreground. You get these nice colors popping in the front, but a nice dark blue in the background. Cameras do not expose, they're not set designed to expose well underwater, so if you just take a camera underwater and take a picture in auto mode, you'll get a very bright background. Um, who knows what you get in the foreground. Um, so we just fill, use these strobes to fill. Um, if you're in the shallows, you can shoot uh, a little bit um, you can use white balance. You don't need to use strobes as much. You know, you can use the strobes to fill as much as you can for these these scenes that have uh, subjects that go further off. But you know, the strobes that we're bringing are they're sort of they're actually quite big, but they still don't light the the reef up for very far. I mean, they light maybe six feet in front of you. So we shoot super wide, a lot of fisheye. Uh, these reefs are from Raja Ampat, that same area. Uh, this is one of my favorite shots. It's a giant clam in the foreground. Um, reef in the background, and this school of juvenile convict fish swimming around. Um, what's interesting is I had gone there the day before, and the reef had been dead. So same dive, same location, different time of day, uh, and when the current picked up, all the fish came out. It's a highly dynamic environment. This is a shot of uh, uh, a reef called Mike's Point in Raja Ampat. Um, there's a ton of current flow through here, you know, these upwellings that feed uh, the coral. And um, this is what that uh, point looks like from, from land. Looks like nothing, really. But it's ringed by really incredible reefs. And in fact, this little island leaves a wake because of the current and was bombed in World War II because they thought it was a boat. Okay, on the other side of the spectrum, we have very, very small things underwater to photograph. This is the smallest seahorse in the world, a, a pygmy seahorse, and uh, that's one of my friend's eyes. So you can see it in the kind of the you know, upper right-hand side of the frame. Tiny, tiny seahorse, very hard to see. If you're over 40, you may never see one in your life. So we have a lot of people who sort of take pictures where the guide points and hope it's in the frame. Um, that's not a good way to do it. Um, that shot was taken in Papua New Guinea, and uh, uh, this, is, you know, this is sort of an idea of one of the resorts there. That's Lolawata Island. We used wheelbarrows to get our, our gear around. Um, and we hopped on a boat, went to Rabal, and the volcano blew while we were there, um, and covered the reef with ash, which was very interesting, but not great for photography. Um, and this is sort of the typical picture people get of pygmy seahorses, you know, a macro shot um, we typically use. 100 millimeter macro lenses, sometimes with diopters to get even closer. I took a bunch of these shots, didn't really like any of them. Um, they're hard to shoot because they don't like you. <laughs> they don't like divers. They don't like light. You know, so if you get really close to one and try to take a picture, they'll turn away and you get kind of shots of them, of their backs a lot. Uh, so this, this picture took a while to get and I asked a friend to take his mask off underwater and just kind of sit in front of the, behind this fan um, and we waited a long time for the pygmy Z horse to just continue doing its thing um, until it totally ignored us, and then I was able to get these shots. So this is that final shot. 
So I like this shot a lot because it shows scale. You know, typically you'll see a full frame shot of one of these things and it looks interesting because it's a bizarre animal, um, but you have no idea how big it is. This is another, uh, another one of my favorites. It's unusual. Most people uh, think this is a forest scene when they see it, um, but there's, a f of course, a fish in there. And um, this, these corals are less than a foot tall, so they, the scale is deceiving. Um, and the, the, the equipment that was necessary to get this was a little bit unusual and um, is it's not used very often. This is the camera setup I used for that. Um, it's an SLR. Uh, typical SLR rig, uh, but it has this very long lens in the front, which is pseudo endoscopic. So it's a relay lens with many, many different elements. I think there are 18 elements or something. Um, bad for optic, bad for image quality, but great for composition. And so what happens is you get a fisheye view, a very, very wide angle view at the end of the lens, that, and you can focus all the way up to the lens. So very unusual underwater. Normally we use big dome ports for wide angle optics that prevent you from getting very close to your subject. So shooting wide angle and macro, close focus wide angle, wide angle is typically very difficult. Um, we call this the insect eye lens. I think in Japan they call it bug eye. And so that's where that name came from. This is one of the shots that you can get with it. Um, if you don't know what these are, it might seem like a normal shot, but that hole in the coral is less than a centimeter in diameter. And so these are two tiny little coral hermit crabs shot wide angle from probably less than a centimeter away, and then you have kind of the, the reef falling off in the background. So pretty unusual shots. Uh, again, these shots were taken uh, in New Guinea, um, but very, very remote New Guinea. These were taken in a place called the Eastern Fields, pretty much halfway between Papua New Guinea and Australia. And um, it's about 100 miles from Port Moresby. Um, and there's a very large sunken volcano that's, I think it's like 400 miles in diameter. And, but it never breaks the surface. So treacherous for ships, so no, no boats go there. There's only one dive boat I know that goes here, and one captain who knows it well. So it's pristine, and you can see in this picture here, it's just shallow reefs, um, you know, when you're above one, um, beautiful water. So these are the corals that um, I was talking about. They're very common corals. These are the kinds of corals you just swim by, because they're so boring. Um, and. Um, but you can get a very different view of these corals with this lens. In specifically, you can insert the lens under the canopy and get uh, kind of shots from inside this coral, uh, coral forest, really. So the strobes have to go in with the lens? So the strobes, ha the question is about strobes. The strobes do not go in with the lens. What I'm doing is putting the strobes on top of the entire, the, on top of the corals and looking for holes I can, from which I can insert the light. So the, yeah, the strobes are attached to the housing by articulating arms. So we can position them wherever we want. Yeah. So here's the you know the final shot. It looks like this kind of mossy bank on the left. You can get some other interesting pictures with this setup. Um, this is an emperor shrimp on a on a rather large nudibranch. Um, with a normal macro lens, you can't get the depth of field necessary to capture this picture. You get sort of the, the, the head and the rhinophores, or you get the shrimp, or you get the tail. Um, because we're shooting super wide angle here, the depth of field is, is quite large. Um, you can also shoot small animals from their point of view. So these are Coleman shrimp on a fire urchin. They're shrimp that live on a fire urchin. They, they snip off the spines in specific areas and live within the protection of these urchins, which are really nasty if you touch. Um, and these kinds of shots that show blue in the background and kind of portray these animals as very as potentially being large um, are, are pretty cool. Uh, these are striped catfish, platosis, striped catfish, again, shot from their point of view. They school and kind of, you know, f feed off of stuff in the sand. Um, and you can just get in front of them and stick the camera in their face. Um, and then again, another very common coral. This is a, um, a, uh, a mushroom coral. And um, or leather coral, mushroom leather coral, and it's it's a really boring coral. But if you get very close, the the polyps suddenly, um, you know, the polyps and the shape can be very interesting. Um, I took this and posted it around Valentine's Day because it looks kind of like a heart. More close-up polyp detail. Uh, this is a, a, a large hard coral, um, hard to photograph in wide angle in an interesting way. So this this shows this kind of alien landscape. 
So I have a, a short video of me actually shooting this rig. You can see how the, the working distance is really close. That's a frogfish, that orange blob. This is a flamboyant cuttlefish. Maybe less interesting, big frogfish. Looks just looks like a blob, really. And these are the those platosis striped catfish. You can see the way they move. This is at night. And I'm I'm putting a red light on because they seem to not like the white light. So a lot of animals don't respond that uh, much to red light because there's not very much red light down there. Um, it was on a DSLR. Um, I mean, the, the shots that I was taking, yeah. No, so, about the oh, the video? I think they shot on a camcorder. A friend shot, yeah. Just camcorder. Okay, back to wide angle stuff. So, I, th I think Ricardo used this picture on one of the events. Um, it's a school of scalloped hammerheads taken in the Galapagos um, off of Darwin, which is the northernmost island, um, which is a place only divers go to because you can't go on land there. Um, so, of course, the Galapagos are, are very well known, are very famous for their giant tortoises, the blue-footed, red-footed boobies, um, the northernmost penguins, uh, and marine iguanas. And so, albatross, some other stuff, too. Um, but underwater, it is a, it is a fantastic place. It's, it's really for advanced divers. The currents are, can be pretty interesting there. So, you can see, you know, bubbles going sideways on that picture on the upper left. These bubbles on the right are bubbles that we exhaled that are now below us. Um, so there are lots of down currents and kind of weird whirlpool type things. Um, so if you're not comfortable in the blue, um, you shouldn't go. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a really great place. And I had been there um, kind of one, one or two times a year for many years before I got this picture of the hammerheads. Um, they, they don't like bubbles. They don't like people or bubbles. So. Typically, when you, when you get close to them, they, they just they swim away from you very quickly. And so everything, all the conditions lined up one year. Um, in fact, this picture in the lower left was taken right before I got that shot of the School of Hammerheads. And basically, there's very, very strong current, but there were large boulders we could hide behind so we didn't have to fight. Um, but the currents would sweep our bubbles away, horizontally, away from the hammerheads. And so this large School of Hammerheads, and it, uh, it was also just two of us, large School of Hammerheads swam right above us, and the bubbles kind of you know, were swept away without disturbing them. And so I got this series of um, shots. And you do have to hold your breath for these shots, which they tell you never to do underwater. So the rebreathers are an option? The rebreathers, rebreathers are an option. Um, I have never taken them to Galapagos. So you have to take your own uh, like shops? Oh, shops for, re uh, yeah, I would not trust another rebreather. Yeah, bring your own rebreather. Um, the problem with rebreathers is they're deadly when there are accidents. <laughs> um, and so this shot on the lower right is actually the scatter shot. So at the moment, the hammerheads decided they had enough of me. They scattered, and you can see them kind of going in every direction. Most of the, the scalloped hammerheads here in the schools are female. Um, they actually joust for position in, within the school. Um, and they're, one of the reasons they're there is to be cleaned by, by other fish. Incidentally, it's very hard to find hammerheads now. If you go virtually to any dive site in the world, there's always a hammerhead point with no hammerheads. And the reason is that there are pretty much, uh, most sharks have been fished out of the ocean for their fins. And so one thing that I uh, fight against a lot is shark finning um, for the purpose of putting it in shark fin soup. Um, if you're interested in sharks, please contact me. Um, so this is really one of the last places on the planet where you can see large schools of hammerhead sharks, another being Cocos, Cocos Island and Malpelo um, off of Costa Rica and Colombia. Um, that might be it, those two places, the only two places I can think of on the planet where you can still see this. Um, there are other things in Galapagos underwater. Um, there's a r healthy turtle population. This is a green turtle at a dive site called Cousins Rock. Um, of course, there are whale sharks too. This is one of the best places to photograph whale sharks. Very large whale sharks, mostly female. I've only ever seen one male whale shark um, in Galapagos. And uh, this was one of the only really friendly ones that I've ever seen there uh, who just kind of uh, hung out. I mean, all of those divers on the surface are out of air. 
So, you know, what we're doing is, you know, trying to snorkel around this whale shark who is just hanging out and rubbing up against boats, doing weird things. Um, the other thing is this whale shark would pick one diver and swim towards it until you got out of the way or it forced you out of the way. <laughs> this is our, our dive guide um, who just couldn't get out of the way fast enough. Um, so they're harmless. They, he, I don't know if he has a snorkel on, but he's out of air. So he's in, in dive gear, but um, on the surface. Yeah. So these sharks are the biggest fish in the ocean. Um, they can get up to around 40 feet long, and they are totally harmless. They're plankton eaters. Um, amazing, sh amazing fish to see. Uh, so more sharks. This is a lemon shark. It is, um, this was taken in the Bahamas. We call this sort of shot a lemon snap. Um, and uh, it's taken at uh, a very, very close range. That water line is on my camera. So the water line is on the dome port of the camera, and the shark is, you know, a couple inches away. Uh, the Bahamas are one of the best places to photograph sharks, big sharks. Um, this is the boat that, that I've been going on a lot. It's called the Shearwater. It goes out of Palm Beach. It's four hours overnight to this area of the Bahamas. Um, the trips that I run are very camera heavy, <laughs> of course. We have serious photographers coming along, and we typically have um, you know, a dozen high-end, uh, very large cameras on these trips. And uh, in the lower left, you can see the population of lemon sharks. It's very healthy there. Um, and what we do is, uh, is sort of sit on the swim step here and put our cameras in the water. And then we use uh, hookless lines with a little bit of fish to attract them to the boat. They don't do this anymore, unfortunately. So if you want to do this, you can now sh go and use a, a pole cam. Um, you know, this was sort of in the early days when uh, things were a little more free. <laughs> um, so you can see some shots of, of how we're getting these shots. That's me in the upper right-hand corner uh, there with a the shark coming in. There are also tiger sharks there. Um, it's a really great place to photograph tiger sharks, and I'll show you some pictures of those in a minute. Um, here are shots of a, of a tiger shark coming in on, on some fish. Again, we use no, no hooks here, uh, so there's no chance of, um, of hurting the sharks. So for those lemon, sh lemon snaps, you know, that mouth open, close motion can last a fraction of a second. So it, it can be very difficult to capture. And the trick really is to take a lot of pictures, you know, and, and not to, um, certainly not to retreat because the camera is the thing between you and the shark. And if, if you're not there, they can sometimes swim on the swim step, which is really uncomfortable for those people around you who have not moved yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we're, we're always yelling, you know, hold the line, hold the line, because you have to make sure that you, you have a solid, solid line of, of cameras there. <laughs> yeah. Also, we use um, both acrylic and glass dome ports underwater. Um, acrylic is, has the same very similar index of refraction as water does, so it's more invisible in the water, but it scratches very easily. So shark skin will scratch an acrylic dome port. If a shark brushes by your port, it basically goes opaque, and then you have to polish it off. Glass doesn't really have that problem, but if you, have a da if you damage a glass dome port, it's not possible really to fix it, certainly not in the field. So here's one of my favorite lemon snap shots, and then I'll show you a few more. It makes them look... Um, pretty vicious, and so I'm, I'm a little bit torn about sharing these pictures uh, because I don't want to portray them as being vicious, but I love that they have teeth and they're these amazing predators, so it's always that, you know, it's always trying to walk that, that fine line in terms of balance. Um, pretty much, if you see a shark with small pointy teeth, it's not dangerous. Small pointy teeth means they eat fish. Um, you're not on their prey list. If they bite you, it's be probably because of something you did. <laughs> so these are like these sharks are kind of five to seven feet long, maybe some eight footers. Um, they're not very big. This is that that moment they snap their jaws shut. And some stuff shot later in the day. This is pretty close to uh, nighttime. 
So we are, we are baiting them using fishing lines with no, no hooks. We tie a little piece of fish on. You can see a little bit of water coming off of the piece of fish in the top of this frame. So baiting it can be a controversial issue for sharks. Uh, A second curtain sink. Um, yeah, yeah, these these shots are second curtain sink. Yeah, um, but shot at the max sink speed. So you know, one two hundredth or one two fiftieth. Um, yeah, baiting can be controversial. Um, many conservationists do not like baiting sharks in. Um, but I, I think really the two options are, don't bait sharks, which means don't you don't get any pictures of sharks or video, which means you cannot incur you can't share how amazing they are to people. Um, and then they get killed. So that's basically how I see it. That's on one side. The other side is do a little bit of baiting, have areas that are very carefully managed for tourism where people pay. Um, sharks are worth, worth much more alive than they are dead. Uh, that has been shown in many, many reports. Uh, tourism brings in much more money than killing uh, one shark. Okay, here's another, this is another shot that is a little bit unusual. It's the eye of a tiger shark. Um, so I've spent a ton of time in the Bahamas photographing tiger sharks. And um, in the Bahamas, we have very clear water uh, when we're in with these tiger sharks. It's very shallow. Um, and they, they move very slowly in these situations. You know, there's not these, it's, a not, it's not a place where tiger sharks are ambushing marine mammals. So they're probably more scavengers here than they are pred uh, ambush predators. Um, and so we really do find that they, they move very slowly and... Um, you know, you have to be careful, of course, because they are wild animals. But as you can see, you can get very close, and they're so fixated on finding out where that fish smell is uh, that they just swim around you looking for this stuff. Um, we do know many of these tiger sharks individually by, uh, by name. We've been, we've been photographing some of them for, uh, you know, eight years or so, some individuals. Um, they're pretty friendly. This is one of them on the bottom. She's probably the most famous tiger shark. She's named Emma. She has a Facebook page. Maybe a Google Plus page even, um, and uh, and so this is this is the best place to photograph tiger sharks. You know, you have lots of opportunity. I've had up to ten around me at a time. Other people have had twenty five show up. Yeah. Is that a the question is about the photo in the upper left. Uh, it is a shipwreck. It's called Sugar Wreck. Uh, very shallow shipwreck, uh, full of life. So it's a it's a great place to dive or snorkel. Um, although I wouldn't recommend recommend snorkeling when tiger sharks are around which we've had happen before. Well, what's the difference in snorkeling and diving? So the difference is you're on the surface, and sharks pretty much always investigate anything floating on the surface. So if you want to get attention from a shark, just jump in and float around. And you'll get, <laughs> there will be, and, and there are sharks around, and they'll investigate you, and they're not necessarily going to just attack you, but what they will do is kind of bump you a lot. So they're very, very careful. Um, and you know, eventually, they might take a, a, a test bite. If you don't react, um, so you do have to be very aware in these situations. You have to always face face the shark and react. I mean, I, I found many times that that you know the sharks almost always approach from behind, and if you turn around and look at a shark, it, there's a good chance it'll turn away. So they're very in tune to where you're looking. Good chance. No, well, I've tried pretty hard down there, <laughs> and I've escaped without ever having contact. Of course, I have a large camera between me and the animals. Um, so I, I decided I wanted to get some, some different shots um, to shake things up a little bit. And uh, so we have done some, some night dives with these sharks as well. You can get a nice black background. And then what I did was I put a macro lens on. Um, and that shot in the lower right is kind of how you feel when you look at this shark. Most shark pictures are shot super wide angle or fisheye. And so you get this long kind of serpentine look to the shark. And that is not what they look like. Um, and uh, and so this, you know, this shot really shows the girth in these animals. Um, and then as they get closer, you can start to focus on detail. And so you know, some gill detail, eye detail. Um, this shot is an uncropped shot of the eye. And if you zoom in a little bit, you can see the shape of the pupil even, this kind of uh, baseball diamond-like shape. Uh, people feel like tiger sharks, like th they communicate more because their eyes are less you know, they're a little bit more like ours. If you look at a lemon shark eye, it looks very feline. You know, it looks alien. Okay, another unusual shot. <laughs> pigs. Yeah. Uh, domestic pigs that have gone feral. So th these are also shot in the Bahamas. 
And um, these pictures were taken during a trip to look for oceanic white tip shark, white tips which are uh, starting to make their way back in the ocean. They were almost completely fished out. Um, in, in the Bahamas, in the tongue of the ocean, you know, in the middle where it's really deep, there's a population now growing of these white t uh, oceanic white tips. Um, and uh, there's an island there called Big Major K, which has these pigs living on the beach with babies. So little piglets there occasionally, and, um, and the locals feed them. So they'll come in and feed them scraps. And so what the pigs are doing now is swimming out to the boats that are, that are coming in. And, um, and so we just take cameras in the water, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. So here's some behind the scenes shots. They're actually, they're pretty big and, um, and they're focused. So uh, a couple of my friends there put peanut butter on their cameras <laughs> and um, that really draws, draws the pigs in and um, yeah, they can, they can in fact swim over you and it hurts. <laughs> so this might be the most fun you can have with a pig legally. And um, <laughs> You know, these are <laughs> these are some shots of uh, you know on the way to taking this shot, which is one of my favorites, favorite portraits. And of course, there were people in it, so I had to then crop them out. So, what's the trick to the split shot? What's the trick to the split shot? So, the trick is to use a large dome port. So, the more surface area you have, uh, the less uh, chop in the water will affect the shot. Um, it's also to um, Depending on the material and how old the dome port is, water will sheet differently. Um, these shots were almost all taken with water completely covering the dome port. So I dip the, the dome in the water and I pull it out of the water and before it's, it, it beads, I take the picture. Some people have managed to figure out ways with their, their dome ports to, to make it completely. The, the coating is, like people use spit and they use baby shampoo sometimes. Um, I've seen Rain-X attempted, which does not work because it beads most of the water off, but then it leads, leads lots of little beads which show up. Um, so I, I find that the way I've been most successful by, is by using clean glass dome ports that have not been etched by diesel. So diesel will etch these dome ports if you leave them in the bottom of a tender of a boat and you know, the water in there has some, some gas, some fuel in it and that I've found has been pretty destructive to glass. So there are a lot of tricks. Why not acrylic? Why not acrylic? I just haven't had as much luck with acrylic. I feel like it doesn't sheet as well for some reason, um, I'm not sure why. Maybe a brand new acrylic port that's super smooth could do it. Um, you can get them with both. The best way is just to keep it dry. You know, keep the top half dry if you can. If it's totally smooth water, you can dry it off and then be very careful about your shot. But very often we're kind of floating and you know, you've just come up from a dive and you're shooting a split and so you have to work with what you have. This is another whale shark, another split of a whale shark shot. Um, this is whale shark feeding, and uh, it's in Isla Mujeres in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, just off of the Yucatan. This is happening right now. In fact, WetPixel has a trip running right now. Yesterday, they reported between three and 400 whale sharks on the surface. So what's happening here, uh, and this town, by the way, is, is fantastic. I mean, if you hate Cancun, you will love Isla Mujeres. Um, it, Isla Mujeres. So this is a place, it's an island, little island off of Cancun that feels still very local. This is the touristy strip, so it's not that bad, and even in the tourist strip, but if you go a couple blocks off, it still feels very local. Everybody drives golf carts around. There are a lot of tourists on the island, but it, it, it's a nice feel. Um, but what's great is it's very close to this whale shark aggregation every summer, and um, on permit, these boats go out uh, and look for these whale sharks that are feeding feeding out there. So this is a shot, each one of those fins is a whale shark. And uh, the average length of a whale shark here, according to some of the scientists there, is just, it's about seven meters. So, you know, kind of 24 feet, something like that. Um, there are, of course, some that are much larger and a few that are much smaller. Um, but this is the largest known concentration of, of the largest fish on the planet. It's, it's really an incredible place. These were taken from the tuna tower of the boat. Um, and if you get kind of lower, you can you know, shoot multiple shark fins in one shot. But really, it's great for underwater photography, of course. You have unlimited opportunity to take pictures of whale sharks here. You know, every minute or two, a whale shark will just swim by you. And if you're not paying attention, it might even hit you. Uh, and um, it's, it's pretty incredible. 
So, and these sorts of silhouette shots are done by free diving down and then swimming so the, the shark you know, is between you and the sun. And there's the added bonus that this one's pooping, <laughs> which always makes for a better shot. We, we run this trip, WetPixel runs this trip every year. Um, there are some other organizations that do as well. If you're more casual about how you want to approach it, you can just go to Isla Mujeres and get on a tourist boat, which will give you half an hour in the water or so. Um, yeah, it's not as good for photography, but it's, it's a great experience and it's much cheaper. And why did you say free diving? Free diving, so uh, you're not allowed to scuba dive here. So um, it is, Sort of, and you really, if you're diving, you can't swim. If you have all that gear on, it's very hard to swim. So it's a much better experience by snorkel and free dive. Um, these are shots of whale sharks feeding. Um, these were taken uh, of sharks when they, um, they're called boteas, like a bottle, and they float like this, vertical, with their mouths open at the top and just gulp in all the, all the plankton they can, and they just sort of spin slowly. And if you're very careful, you can get close and shoot right down their mouths here. And this is what they're after. So these are tiny eggs, or little bonito-like tuna. And uh, these, these guys are spawning there uh, at every full moon. And so the, the sharks are in the area waiting, and when it happens, they aggregate in groups of hundreds. And hundreds are th what you count on the surface. And so it may be that there are many more. Yeah, it's great. So you have, you know, we have six hours a day to take pictures of these sharks, and you can, uh, get pretty creative. There is a random picture in here. Oh, they went away. Okay, here, this is a video of, um, of me swimming around. That gives you an idea of how many there are. This was shot in one take. It's 11 whale sharks went by. Okay, this is, a, this is another shot. I, I call this one interspecies encounter. Um, this is actually in the talk that Ricardo embedded on the Google events. So if you want more information about this shot in this area, you can go check that out. Um, but this, is, this, this was taken off of uh, Dominica in the Caribbean. And um, it's a place uh, known for its sperm whale population, and uh, there are a couple pods of sperm whales off the coast here, um, which are all very well studied by scientists. You know, they know each of the whales individually. Um, photographers can get permits as well to, to get in the water with them there. Marine mammals are, are pretty well protected, so if you want to get in the water with a whale, you have to be on permit. Um, we use hydrophones to find these whales. Sperm whales make a lot of noise. They um, they click, they have, a, in fact, a coda for po dis certain populations, so you can tell which population a whale is from by the pattern that they use to greet each other. Um, they use very loud noises at depth, 1,000 meters down where they feed, so they have specific feeding noises, and so you can track them as they move around on their dives, which are typically 45 to 50 minutes long. Uh, and then when they come up, hopefully you're in the right place. Um, we got really lucky there. There were a lot of sperm whales um, socializing. So these sperm whales were rubbing up against each other, they're rubbing dead skin off of each other, um, and uh, it was a really spectacular to be able to get up so close to them. Um, I think they're the largest carnivore on the planet. Um, in theory, the males can get up to around 60 feet long. They have teeth, and um, these are mostly juvenile males and females of all ages. Um, and again, because they were so uh, and they just basically ignored us here. You could take some more interesting shots instead of just going for the, you know, whatever shot you can get. So I shot splits, um, these vertical splits, and then I dove down to their heads to try to get shots of them hanging in the water upside down. Uh, this is also on snorkel, on free dive. More shots here. Um, the one on the left is uh, that little piece, that little piece there. Um, of red is actually part of a squid arm. 
which is what they feed on. Uh, this one in the middle is a, a juvenile about to do a tail slap on the surface. You know, you've seen, if you go whale watching, you'll see tails come out of the water and slap. That's what it looks like underwater. And then this one on the right may be uh, nursing, although that's unconfirmed. Um, and uh, I don't think anyone knows how sperm whales nurse. Um, it could be like this, who knows. <laughs> if only marine mammal researchers worked with photographers. Um, now this whale is named Scar. He was, this is a few, maybe three years ago, at the time around 10 years old, and uh, was the friendliest of the bunch. And he's been interacting with humans f for his entire life. And so this whale would literally just come in and get right in front of you. And um, in fact, you could swim in, uh, you had to swim away from this whale to get a picture of it. Um, and uh, this is the guide who knows Scar the best. And um, you know, I would never advocate swimming up to a whale and touching it. Um, but this whale, Scar, actually closed his eyes. You can see his eyes there that are closed. Um, and then all of us went in and just like rubbed him down. You know, it was, we couldn't resist really. Pretty incredible encounter. Um, the One of your GPS posts said that he disappeared uh, last year. So uh, it's, uh, the question is about whether he's still there yeah. or not. Um, uh, I have not seen any recent pictures of Scar. They do leave, males leave the area where they grew up when they get to a certain age and they go to the polar regions to then hunt and eat until they're much larger and, and they come back to breed, to mate. So. Um, I'm not sure whether he's still there. People are still going there because it's still a, a really great place to get, a lot of film crews are there uh, to get footage of sperm whales. But I'm not sure if he's still there. And, and I like this shot because it just shows that, you know, that sort of moment that of connection between, you know, whale and human. I have a little bit of video of the sperm whales as well. Um, this was taken with a, a Canon 5D Mark II. One of the great things about the cameras now is you can sort of instantly start shooting video if you see something that is better captured that way. Uh, this is natural light. They're really too big to light up with strobes. All these sounds are from the whales and that tapping, uh, that pattern, you know, this kind of, that pattern is the pattern that this, this group uses. How easy it to, is it to control the camera? It's really easy to turn it on. It's hard to ensure that you're in focus. We pretty much pre-focus these. They're shot so wide, I'll focus on my fin and just stop down. Um, but they're also um, hard to hold steady. So dedicated video cameras are designed to be held steady and the housings are, have a lot of mass, so it's hard to shake them. But an SLR housing has two handles on the side, so if you just move a little bit, it shakes. So it takes a lot of practice to, to shoot smoothly. And, and you know, it's, I think it's impossible to have a shot that looks like it was complete, you know, completely smooth with an SLR. Um, I think that's all the pictures I have to show today. Um, I do have, this portfolio link goes to my Google Plus page where there are like 300 pictures uploaded. Um, and uh, of course, WetPixel is uh, a site for those of you who are interested in, in underwater photography. Um, I think we have time for some questions, do we? Yeah. Um, do you do any diving in Monterey? Do I do any diving in Monterey? Um, I do some diving in Monterey, but not as much as, as I'd like to. Um, I've actually done more diving in Alaska than I have in Monterey. Um, but it's right here and it's, it's incredible. So it's some of the best cold water diving in the world. Uh, in fact, this weekend there's uh, a, a big shootout in Monterey where people go and compete uh, in a photo contest and there's a film festival that I'm, where, I, where I'll be speaking as well. Yeah. Other questions? Radio triggers for the flash? So we don't really, we don't use radio triggers. We use um, either, either elect electrical sync cords or uh, optical sync. So, um, you know, you have to trigger this, the camera somehow. Um, there, for a while, when digital cameras came out, um, underwater photographers lost the ability to use TTL because every, you know, and that kind of went DTTL and ITTL and Canon went ETTL and none of the underwater strobe manufacturers could catch up. So we shot, and that's when I started shooting. So we 
pretty much shot manual. Everything was manual. Um, but I find in general, all you need is a signal to fire the strobe because if you rely on TTL, especially for macro, and you have more than one strobe, the pictures end up looking really flat. And so the idea is to think about shadows. You know, the shadows are the most important thing for underwater macro photography, certainly. You always want to think about where that shadow is going to be cast. And since so many animals underwater are totally camouflaged, um, you know, the best way to cut them out of the environment is to make them cast a shadow on their, you know, on their host. Nope. Do, do you go ahead. Okay, what do you think is your most dangerous encounter ever? <laughs> my most dangerous encounter ever? Um, I, I don't think my most dangerous encounters have been wildlife related. It's mostly <laughs> been, it's, it's mostly been in a situation where um, you're in a very high current environment and you've pushed pushed yourself somehow, you know, I'm too deep, I'm in deco, I don't have much air left, and all I can see are my bubbles streaming off into the blue, you know, when I'm ready to let go to go do a um, safety stop where you drift for three to five minutes plus deco time. Um, and so there have been some moments where, like that that are very, like visceral memories where I'm, I'm sort of, my back is to the current and I'm just staring at my bubbles going down and thinking, okay, this is gonna be, I hope the boat follows me, you know. Um, and so there are some moments like that. Luck luckily, I've, I've never had anything truly life-threatening. Um, I think most of my friends who have been doing this for a long time, you know, have, have been bent or have had some kind of serious malfunction. You know, their first stage blows off their tank or something really disastrous. Um, and, uh, you know, the only real, the only lethal incidents, of, at least amongst my friends, have involved rebreathers. So, you know, they have a rebreather accident and they die. Um, or the occasional surf photographer that gets smashed into the coral. So they're, they're just, a few, you know, sometimes they're really unfortunate events, especially the rebreather stuff. You know, it's even really experienced rebreather divers can have accidents like that. It's less forgiving than open circuit. So Other questions? Done much diving at all uh, I, I've done some rebreather diving. I don't own one, um, but I typically will dive it in, New in Papua New Guinea, where there's a boat that I go on that has them. So why, uh, it's mostly that I just don't own one. I haven't, I haven't invested in one. And, um, and well, I think if you don't use them a lot, if, you, if you're not very comfortable with them, they can be dangerous. Um, I, I love them. I mean, they're rebreathers, for those of you who don't know, are fully closed, they're fully closed circuit, so they scrub the CO2 out of what you exhale and inject very, a very small amount of oxygen into the system. So it's bubble free. Um, and almost everything underwater will, is afraid of bubbles. So. I mean, if you ever go underwater and hold your breath or are on a rebreather, divers make a ton of noise. You know, you can hear divers long before you can see them in the water, and it affects the wildlife. You know, you can s immediately see the fish start hiding. With every exhalation, if you have someone on scuba who's taking video, you can watch the fish pulse in and out as they breathe. And with a rebreather, you just don't see that. Um, and the other benefit of using a rebreather for photography and videography is that as you breathe, your buoyancy does not change because there's a counter lung. So you exhale into the counter lung so the amount of air stays constant. With open circuit, every time you inhale, you start to float. And every time you s exhale, you start to sink. And so that makes it really hard to hold the camera steady. And um, so rebreathers are, most videograph serious videographers will shoot on rebreather. Uh, so the question's about awareness and conservation around sharks. Um, I work really closely with an organization called Shark Savers, um, which is a conservation organization dedicated to um, really uh, policy and awareness around shark finning and um, you know uns how unsustain unsustainable it is. And so mostly, I and mean, most of that direct action happens in the the Chinese speaking world. So mostly um, Hong Kong, China, Taiwan, um, but a lot of the fundraising happens here. Um, so yeah, I think most people are sort of afraid of sharks. You know, there's that fallout from Jaws and a lot of the, the media we see. Shark Week is coming up. Shark Week is usually 90 or 95 percent sensationalist stuff about sharks and, you know, top 10 most dangerous sharks, that kind of thing. Um, and so we're working directly with them to try to influence programming as well and to see how much we can get them um, to publish um, real facts around sharks. I mean, there's an average of five people killed a year by sharks, but you hear about every one of those, maybe more than once, you know, and so it, f it feels like people are being killed by sharks all the time, um, but in fact, um, you, you're probably more likely to die from just about anything else, you know. So I'm not directly involved in a lot of the, po in the policy um, 
stuff. But uh, what we noticed in the last few years is that a lot of countries and states are now banning shark fin. So California banned shark fin. Um, so this is the last year you can you can sell. I mean, you, you can't buy it anymore if you're if you own a restaurant. Um, you can still serve it this year. Um, and so we're finding a lot of legislation now to ban shark fins. Um, but mostly it has to happen in in Asian high high density Asian areas. So mostly in Asia. Um, and it's already starting. You know, Chinese government said they won't serve it anymore at official government events. A lot of celebrities in Hong Kong, Taiwan, China are now speaking out against it. Um, and so it's really an education thing. When most people learn about what's involved in in making a bull shark fin, which is basically finning a shark and throwing away the body and then keeping the fin because it's so much more valuable, um, they, especially the younger generation, is very much against it. So hopefully, you know, people will have their, their minds changed before sharks are gone. Other questions? Um, are animals sensitive to light? Are animals sensitive to light? Yeah. Uh, yeah, some, most animals are affected by light in some way. Um, this is all, it's all, again, highly controversial as well because, I mean, if you imagine a giant strobe flashing in your face if you're a pygmy seahorse, it could be very distracting. <laughs> um, uh, but having said that, I've seen pygmy seahorses feeding while they're being photographed. So, you know, sometimes they're not, not affected. Um, I, I think they're, um, you know, most things will just run from things that are not that are scary and th they'll typically try to get away from you at just as a diver regardless of your lights um, but sometimes you'll get you get one shot and that first strobe flash will will make the animal run we do use red lights a lot at night um, we find that many animals are less sensitive to red light um, presumably because there's no red light down there and so any animal that's red is probably trying to hide because there's no red light other questions Uh, do I shoot more landscapes underwater or? Okay, yeah. So I shoot a lot of uh, a lot of reefscapes, so you know reef reef scenes that are colorful and uh, show that there's a lot of life in the water, uh, and occasional interesting topography like crevices and and a little bit of cave stuff. Um, wrecks are really artificial reefs these days. If you if you sink a ship and leave it for any amount of time, it will collect a huge amount of wildlife around it. So some people are interested in the wrecks for historical context and you know they want to go find the bell or you know swim through the grand ballroom um, but I, I really like wrecks because uh, they collect a lot of wildlife so in some wrecks in fact you can't see the wreck it is completely covered in coral and fish you have to be super far away to photograph an entire wreck yes typically and there are some photographers who specialize in that you know they'll go down 300 feet with a heavy tripod and plant themselves in front of a giant wreck taking long exposure stuff in, in the dim light, and then they, they'll decompress over hours going back to the surface. So yeah. there been any species that have been particularly elusive for you to photograph? Species that have been elusive? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, I'm, uh, you know, we went looking for sperm whales in Japan, and we had, like, uh, one of my friends and I were the first to photograph sperm whales eating giant squid. Um, but, you know, the giant squid is kind of like the classic elusive animal that, that no one's really photographed. I mean, there's a little bit of video on the surface of one alive, and that's it. Um, I would say that as a scuba diver, it's not realistic to think that I would ever see a giant squid alive because they live at 1,000 meters. Um, yeah, but th there are a lot, of, a lot of animals I like to see. I'd love to do a Humboldt squid. They're like five to seven foot squid on the, you know, California coast near Mexico uh, into Baja, California. Um, and they're, they're just schools of squid that can be, that flash, and you know, they're really cool. Are we done? We're done. We're <laughs> done. All right. Okay, thanks. All right. Thanks, Eric, for coming to Google. Thank you.